Good evening, everyone. We're happy to have you today with Dr. Aisha al -Swaidi. Uh, Dr. Aisha Swedi uh, completed her PhD in Earth uh, Science at the University of Oxford in UK in 2012, following uh, a Master's of Geology at the University of Kansas uh, in Lawrence, USA, and Bachelor's of Environmental Science from the University of Arizona in the USA as well. She was the she was the recipient of the uh, Scholarship Coordination Scholarship for Outstanding Students under the uh, patronage, uh, patronage of um, the President of the UAE's office. And she has been a member of the Petroleum Geoscience Department, now, uh, um, which is now the Earth uh, Science uh, Department since 2012 and has contributed to, to a wide number of uh, courses. Um, welcome, Dr. Aisha. The floor is all yours. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. If you have questions as I'm talking, um, you can pop them in the chat um, and I will answer them as I go along. Um, I've had to do a lot of these of online courses, so, um, so I'll read them as I'm going and um, otherwise you're welcome to save them until the end. Um, and, so today I'm going to talk about COVID-19 towards the end of my talk, but I'm going to talk about what can we learn from deep time about disease and climate change. Um, and, you know, we've all been in this kind of lockdown situation now since March, I guess. Um, and we've known about COVID-19 since December when it first started to emerge and we kind of knew that something was going on and so this has given me as a geoscientist a lot of time to kind of reflect about our role as humans on the planet and to kind of think about this and so I thought today my area of expertise is really related to geological time um, and so what I thought today that I would talk about is I'll talk about this concept of geological time because probably all of you have seen the um, geological time scale but you've never really thought about it to the levels that I'm going to talk about it today um, but you can tell me if I'm wrong because <laughs> that might be the case um, so I'm going to talk about that I'm going to talk about kind of mass extinctions through geological time and then I'm going to talk about this kind of idea of the Anthropocene um, as a, a, a time period and, and whether that's relevant. And then I'm going to talk about something which recently has been coined related to COVID-19, which is called the anthropopause or the great pause of 2020. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but just to say that museums are already starting to consider how they will document through artifacts this specific point of time. Right. So normally museums, they're kind of now and they're not really thinking about what am I going to preserve from right now in relation to what's going on. Um, so we're in this kind of very unique position of having lots of global data, lots of resources online, lots of global access and globalization. And so, you know, as geoscientists, we're constantly thinking about time. And so we can now start to think about this point in time under COVID-19, how that's impacting us climatically, environmentally, and as a, a population on this planet by, in terms of biodiversity, biogeochemical cycles, um, and how that relates to deep time, and what do we know about deep time um, and disease, which in fact is actually very little if we really think about that. Um, so I'll go from there. And so I'm just going to start going through my slides. I, I'll stop at one point, and I'm going to go to some NASA images just to kind of highlight my point okay all right so so here's my talk it's going to be in three parts uh the first part i'm going to talk about geological time and you um because you should understand your position as an earth scientist as a petroleum geologist or as a geologist in the context of earth history where do you stand and then i'm going to talk about earth's mass extinctions which is what i work on in relative time my research relates to mass extinctions largely in the mesozoic um, and what I think about is what was the duration of those mass extinctions? How long did they last? What was the impact? And how long did it take the Earth to recover from these mass extinctions? And now I'm going to come to this kind of topical point, which I just mentioned, the COVID-19 
19, this anthropopause, and why maybe you haven't thought about this as a geoscientist, but actually you may play a critical role in understanding the future of pandemics and how pandemics can migrate from ecosystems, from earth systems and, and into other systems through um, changes in our natural environment and our biogeochemical cycles. So here's just a little cartoon. Um, you'll see that I have cartoons all through um, and I'll talk a bit more about the Anthropocene and what it is. Um, so how do we define time? Um, you know, you've probably all seen this kind of chronostratigraphic figure. You've probably looked at it. You might have memorized it. And you probably didn't really think about it very much after you took intro to geology or paleontology or geology of the earth or earth systems, right? You probably never really thought about what these little tiny, and I hope you guys can see my mouse because I can't see it, um, the little tiny yellow um, points are on the image. So in the chat, how many people know what the little tiny yellow dots are that go along at the boundaries that have time attached to them? Just say I, basically. I mean, there's 13 of you. I'm guessing that maybe half might know what they are. One, two, three, okay. So it's probably more than half, right? So those little yellow dots are basically these golden spikes. And these golden spikes are really, really critical um, to the um, geological time scale. Um, it's okay, I can't see my cursor either. I have two monitors. So <laughs> my cursor is refusing to go to my other monitor where the primary presentation is. So don't worry. But they're basically the very little tiny yellow dots, yeah, yellow dots that you see at each boundary at each stage. Okay, those are called golden spikes. And so these golden spikes, they're basically geological markers and stratigraphic points. They could be anywhere in the world and they basically mark stage boundaries. Okay, and, and, and they're, they're defined and these golden spikes that you can see in this image here, here's one for the Ediacaran. These golden spikes are put in locations based on how complete that section is, how good the fossil record is, how good the magnetostratigraphy, maybe there's an absolute age there where that golden spike is. Now, what many people don't realize is that these golden spikes can be changed. So if somebody, maybe one of you, identifies a new section somewhere in the world that's much better than the existing golden spike, it can be replaced. Okay, so these are kind of these floating kind of let's say story tale boundaries that, that we as geologists allow us to kind of say oh this is our example this is our case point but it may not be the best one but it's the best one that we have right now okay and we have the most data on it we can compare it globally and um it it has enough data in it that it represents this stage boundary right so we've all seen this figure this is the international chronostratigraphic um, figure. This is from the International Commission and I'll come back to this a little bit when I talk about the Anthropocene and I, this figure is fine right from a scientific perspective but I actually prefer Ray Troll's figure which is a cartoon um, because it really kind of puts it into a perspective of how do we stack time right because time is stacked for us as geologists. It's stacked um, geological rock unit on top of geological rock unit um, and you can see in this Ray Troll cartoon, he kind of has the death of all of these different organisms, right? So you all know about the Great Oxidation event, um, and you know about the wipeout of the dinosaurs um, at the KPG boundary. You probably know about the great dying at the Permo-Triassic boundary. In fact, the Permo-Triassic boundary, one of the very well-studied sections is here in the UAE in the Northern Emirates. Um, it's not the GSSP, but it's a section which has provided a lot of information about what was happening at the Permatriassic in that interval. Um, and so I think with this image, you actually get a bit more of a sense about what is happening at these boundaries. And that each of these boundaries is often associated with a mass extinction or a major event in geological time right could be a complete wipeout of species and i'll talk a little bit more about these mass extinctions 
And what you should see at the bottom of this array troll figure, and this is a very recent figure, he has six mass extinctions. Now, there's a big question, and I'll talk about the six mass extinctions. And the question is whether we are right now, as a species, on this planet, occupying this planet with other organisms, whether we are experiencing and going through the next major mass extinction of species on Earth. Right? We have, and we've all studied, that there are five mass extinctions in Earth history. Right, And you can see those five here. Um, the Ice Age, the kind of um, snowball Earth theory that you guys probably all learnt about, um, the oxygen crisis, the great dying, all of these different things, right? The camp volcanism at the um, Triassic-Jurassic boundary that wiped out um, all of the pteropods, um, the asteroids that wiped out the dinosaurs, etc. Okay, and this idea about right now is that we are entering a new epoch in Earth history. We are entering what is called the Anthropocene. Okay, now the Anthropocene, as a formal definition of time is actually has not been accepted yet by the International Commission on Stratigraphy. It won't be voted on until 2021. Now the reason for that is how do we define the base of the Anthropocene, right? And that comes down to how do we define time. For all of the other boundaries, we have a clear understanding of how we define time, right? We know that it's there's a mass extinction all of the dinosaurs were wiped out right all of the pteropods were wiped out all of these soft-bodied organisms that we now find um in canada and the arctic shield which we don't see anywhere else in the world were all wiped out right so those are very very specific periods of time and we're talking about events which happened over millions of years and not just a few years right so this is the problem is now we're trying to think about this new epoch called the Anthropocene and we're trying to define it as it's happening. Previously as geologists when we think about time and when we set time up we're defining it way after it's happened right so we're looking back at all of the evidence but for the Anthropocene we're trying to define it right now. And at the last International Com uh, Stratigraphic Commission meeting, which was last year, it was a huge discussion about how we can find the base of the Anthropocene, okay? So given that humans as a species, if we think about Earth history in a kind of 24 hour time period, humans have barely even been here for a few seconds, right? We haven't been on this planet for very long. The planet did many things before we arrived on it. OK, um, and so we are now trying to decide that we as a species are so important to this planet that one, we should have a time period named after us, the Anthropocene. The Cretaceous isn't named after dinosaurs, right? Jurassic's not named after dinosaurs. We don't call them the dinos dinosauricene or something like that, right? So we are so important that we've now named this period after ourselves or we're going to and it's likely that it will be approved and now we're trying to decide what terrible thing did we do as a species that will allow us to define the boundary of this of this time period okay so one of the big things that people have thought about given that we consider that all other geological boundaries are based on major stratigraphic changes, evidence of transitions in fossil records, major chemical signatures that could be strontium changes, carbon strain changes, um, oxygen changes in the sedimentary record, all of these different things. We have to decide where are we going to put this boundary. Now, some people said, well, we should put this boundary at the onset of industrialization. Okay, we're gonna, I'll show you guys the Keeling curve, the carbon dioxide curve from Mauna Loa, which some of you may be familiar with, which is how we know that carbon dioxide has been increasing over the last, um, you know, 40, 50 years in the atmosphere. And we know this from ice core records as well, which date back much further. Um, but, you know, so we, so we see this change and that increase increase in CO2 is often linked to changes in industrialization, to the industrial revolution, to a transition 
from just wood burning to wood and coal and oil burning to get our energy and for productivity and to increase the industrial processes on earth, right? Um, however, this is a problematic marker, right? It was discussed that perhaps it should be at the onset of the development of plastics because many of the early plastics will not biodegrade. They are permanently lodged in our sedimentary record and they will be there for the next million or more years, right? That was discussed. And one of the things that people are strongly in favor of is using the atomic bomb testing that was done in the US in the early part of the 20th century as a marker because we know that reset the carbon-14 dating clock, it reset uranium clock, it resets so many stratigraphic clocks in terms of chemical data that it is considered by the people who work on the Anthropocene that this may be a useful marker. Um, and so the marker which is going to um, mark this human change, this human time period where human population on the planet has expanded, industrialization has expanded, is going to be marked by something which ended up being a tragedy by war, effectively. Um, and we do see certainly that since the 1920s and 1950s, when they first started working on atomic bombs, um, that there has been a lot of change. Um, there's been globalization has taken place and so you know small communities which were isolated now have expanded beyond their normal boundaries um, and so this is certainly a big transition in our history but is it enough to make a geological marker of a boundary um, and to think about that you really have to think about you know our ancestors in the future um, our, our future ancestors <laughs> Um, and how they will effectively perceive time. Um, if you think about what you've studied as a student um, or as, uh, as a scientist about geological time and how we measure geological time, and then you try to apply that to right now, it's probably difficult to think of a specific marker. In your life, likely, you can think of specific markers. It could be a birthday that was memorable. It could be a tragedy that happened in your family, all of those are time markers for you. Um, but is an atomic bomb being tested a good time marker for a geological time scale, which really for geologists is equivalent to the periodic table? I don't know. Um, and the argument for this to be the, the definition of that boundary is difficult. Um, and what many scientists don't realize, especially young scientists, is that you can play an active role in deciding how the Stratigraphic Commission will vote um, by attending meetings by the Stratigraphic Commission um, and, and by having a say to reading articles about how boundaries are defined and giving your opinion um, to people who are engaged in the Stratigraphic community. And the Anthropocene is something which affects all of us. And as I said, I'm, I'm going to come back to it again. Um, so here's that Anthropocene. I've talked about this kind of formal definition and I've talked about how will we define the base of the GSSP or the global stratotype point, right? That where are we going to put that golden spike um, for the Anthropocene? Okay, so just to come back to that Anthropocene and why do scientists think it's important? Maybe you're thinking, who cares, right? I don't care if they name a new time period. It's kind of irrelevant, right? But the reason that many scientists who work on quaternary geology and Holocene geology feel that it's significant to mark this boundary is really because of these figures here. Um, and you can see this massive increase in human population on the planet, right? We've more than doubled our population on the planet. Um, if you just notice on this figure, this is a predictive figure, right? So it goes to 2100, um, and that's based on modeling uh, that's done by the UN, really. Um, but our population has grown so rapidly, both in Asia and elsewhere, um, that it's become unprecedented, right? Where do humans live? People who live in villages before now are migrating to cities. Um, I'm going to show you guys some images uh, from Google Earth that really highlight this impact of this expansion of humans, not just since the 1800s, but in fact, just in the last 20 years. Um, and certainly if you live here in the Gulf region um, from 1990 to today, we see a huge change 
in our um, countries, right? And how much, how many buildings there are, how many people there are. And we see that expansion and happening in real time. Um, and the other reason why scientists are really, really fighting hard for this Anthropocene is because of this Mauna Loa observatory figure, which really highlights that change in CO2. And I'll put this in the context of global CO2 emissions over time in a moment. Um, but I think the thing to note here is that, yes, we've had higher CO2, but that's been naturally induced. And so in terms of our geochemical records through time, our impact and our presence as humans on this planet is really quite significant and will show up geochemically, even if our bones don't in the geological record in the future okay all right so i'm going to talk about mass extinction um and hopefully that's something that you're all excited about because most people are excited about dinosaurs um so this is just some figures of mass extinctions and i put that um troy ray troll uh, figure back up because it shows you those mass extinctions and it shows you the kind of an image of the types of dinosaurs that are uh, um, that went extinct, the pteropods, the fish, um, eurypterids, which my husband's a geologist and that's actually one of his favorite fossils is the eurypterid. Um, and um, so you can see all those creatures there. Um, and perhaps you have a favorite animal that went extinct like a cyber-toothed tiger or a woolly mammoth or something like that. Um, but I think, you know, you all have that visual image there. And then on the opposite side of the figure, you can see this image, which shows you the proportion of genuses that went extinct for each of these events. Okay, and so this is a relative proportion. And you can see that there are some events early on in Earth history, which are much more significant than, for example, the late Maastrichtian um, dinosaurian extinction. Okay, um, and so this is just to give you kind of a visual idea that mass extinctions have happened they've been happening there are small ones there are big ones um and they're just a part of our geological record okay right okay so here's those mass extinctions and then in the other figure hopefully it's kind of clear um it's hard to find a good picture of this but you can see um changes in um, the CO2 and also in temperature. And these are modeled changes. And it's very easy to associate these changes, be it in temperature or in CO2, to these mass extinction events. And so my area of specialization really is related to the Triassic and Jurassic. And so if you have a look on the figure with the mass extinctions, you can see here that's event 12 and event 13 that are on that figure. And if you go to the Mesozoic, part of the CO2 and temperature figure, what you should see is that at those boundaries, at the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, and in the Jurassic, that you have major changes in CO2 and in temperature. So we see in the geological record that these major events, which happened over 20 million years or more, are strongly linked to climatic and to carbon dioxide changes in the atmosphere, right? I think you all know the basic principles of greenhouse warming and that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and that methane is a greenhouse gas and that we also have sulfur and um, nitri nitrous oxides, right? All contribute to greenhouse processes. And so through geological time, we see that these events are strongly coupled to biogeochemical forcing. Um, and it's coupled to the hydrological cycle, to the carbon cycle, to albedo on the planet reflection. Um, they're coupled to temperature changes um, and they're coupled to the oceans, whether the oceans are oxic, if we're in a hot, hot climate, the thermohaline circulation, which drives ocean productivity and nutrient availability can shut down. And we already see that today, right? With global warming, we see in the Gulf of Mexico dead zones, we see impacts on things like El Nino and the Nino, which impact um, fisheries in South America, okay? And so, you know, we, we know and we, and we see in the geological record that we can strongly link climatic forcing, climatic change, planetary orbital forcing um, to mass extinction. 
Now it's great, okay? So we're thinking about mass extinction in deep time, but the one thing that's different is that today, the mass extinction that scientists believe is happening, the sixth great mass extinction, is linked to CO2 rising and linked to temperature changes and linked to human activity changes on the planet. But those processes are not natural, right? When we think about mass extinction in deep time, we're talking about natural processes driving changes in CO2. We're talking about major plate tectonic events, large igneous provinces with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, square kilometers of volcanism happening destabilization of these big ice blocks, which contain methane, clathrate, release of methane into the atmosphere. We're talking about these huge processes, natural processes, which have impacted the climate. And we certainly don't have any of those processes happening today. Tectonic processes on Earth are very slow. We don't have any large igneous provinces. Yeah, we have volcanoes and they do erupt and they do impact the environment, but the impact is on the order of tens of years, right? So if we think about something like the Jurassic, um, the impact of volcanism in the Southern Hemisphere, in South Africa, Karoo, and in Antarctica, Farah, as well as in South America, that volcanism, which was about 50,000 square kilometers or more of volcanism, resulted in mass extinction, carbon cycle perturbations, sulfur cycle perturbations, which lasted on the order of tens of thousands of years. Okay, so these are these geological processes, these natural processes which impact the the climate of the planet, the biogeochemical cycles and the planet in deep time are very long events. They happen over long amounts of time. Okay. When we start to think about this Anthropocene event, here we're talking about really contracted events which are extremely short. And perhaps there are events like this in geological time, but obviously because sediments get packaged together, it's difficult for us to differentiate out these intervals on a year by year basis. We can do it with ice cores, right? But it's much harder for us to do it going back into the Jurassic or the Cretaceous. What we do know for our time here on the planet for the Anthropocene is that we can monitor how species have been changing and how their population diversities have been changing over the last 40 or 50 years, if not 100 years and more, okay? We know, for example, that the dodo went extinct. Um, the dodo was heavily hunted on Mauritius by various um, sailors and, and travelers who traveled to the island. It was kind of a dumb bird, didn't really try to run away. Um, and so we, we do know that our extinctions that we see are strongly linked to the threat of us as humans on this planet, okay? And as our population increases, then we can really start to look at the impact of our human activity on the planet, okay? I'm just gonna close my image and go to some NASA images. Um, hopefully you can see them all. Put it up here. All right. Um, and so these are NASA images which are related to climate change. Um, and you can look it up yourself. You can take a um, have a look at this picture here. And so these are images from Greenland. The one that is over here, I hope you can see my cursor. This is from 2014. And this one is from the same time in 2016. And you can see this big increase in melting. And maybe this doesn't seem so significant, right? Um, if we start to look at something like this, this is open pit mining. Open pit mining, which obviously is something strongly linked to geology, is basically where they go and they just dig up thousands and thousands of um, cubic meters of sediment in order to mine for rare earth minerals, um, coal, diamonds, and things like that. Okay, so I'll put it here. Um, this image is from 1984 and the other image is from 2016. So there's a significant change in land use processes here. And that land which has been ripped up is the land where is a habitat for organisms, right? Um, this is an image from China. Um, and you can see that one of the images is from 2016 in March and the other is from July. So you can see that there's big changes um, in the green area and also in the size of different bodies of water. Um, and I think this one is so shocking, really. Um, I'm just going to skip forward. All right. So here's one that's from Iran. 
um, and you can see how the lake has changed color and this is largely due to land change runoff. Um, you can see the green areas around it, there are cities there. Um, and those cities have been rapidly expanding along the margins of this water body, right? We live in a very arid area. Water is important. We live around water and that means that it's easy for us to misuse water resources. Um, all right, skip that one. All right, so there's a lot of images here. I think there's in fact there's about a hundred images here. So I strongly encourage you guys to have a look. Um, and this is one of the ones that to me is really, really shocking when it comes to land use changes. And I don't know how many of you have been to India, but if you go to India, India is heavily populated. But it's also home to a huge variety of wildlife. One of these images is from 1991 and the other one is from 2016. And certainly New Delhi has not decreased in population. This population has continued to increase and expand into the jungle areas around New Delhi, right? So where do all the organisms go that live in that forest area? Forget about CO2 and oxygen and you know, photosynthetic processes changing, industrial processes changing. But if we think about the organisms that live in these environments, where do they go, right? Who, where, where are they, what habitat do they have left? Um, if anything, the other areas that they could go to now also have people living in them. All right. Um, let's see, I'll skip the wildfire ones. Gonna go to one more. Right, so last year I went to Lake Mead and Lake Mead's in the US. And Lake Mead provides power and water to several states, to Nevada, Arizona, and California. Um, and it's heavily drawn down. And when I was there last year, I actually took some pictures of the lake. And it's at the lowest it's ever been since it was actually built. Because the populations of California, Nevada, and Arizona have been growing so much that the demand for water and the demand for power coming from this, this lake has increased so much that the lake has basically dropped to the lowest level that it's ever been at. Right? You can actually see layers um, of karstification, which happened when the lake was at its maximum. Okay? So this is just to give you guys an idea of this kind of change which is happening on our planet. And as I said, there are tons of images here. Um, and no, it's not due to raining, to changes in rainfall, okay? Um, Lake Mead does go up and down, that's true. Uh, rain patterns in the US have changed, but not significantly. Um, what has changed is how much snowfall is falling in the high, in higher up in, in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so that's changed, that's decreased. Um, the snowy period, the rainy period is shorter because of climatic change, but the primary change is the demand on water that actually comes from the lake. Um, we spoke to the fisheries manager there and he said they, they have to take, they have to let out more water to go to the communities than actually can fill up the lake, right? So it, the balance is not there hydrologically for that lake. Um, you can look into it. I mean, there's lots of lakes like this. We can see it with many lakes all over Asia and um, in China. And as I said, there's so many pictures here. Um, I strongly encourage you guys to go and take a look. Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> um, and if you're bored, it's, you know, something to do. Um, so let me come back to my presentation. Uh, right, here we go. And, and so, as I said, we, you can see these changes, and these changes are largely driven by us, right? And our impact on climate and on the environment, our impact on the world around us, right? We here in the Gulf, we have a heavy dependence on desalinated water. Um, that means that we're putting more saline water in, cold saline water back into the Gulf, and that's changing the Gulf. We know that the Arabian Gulf is shrinking, it's tectonically shrinking. Um, it's also shrinking because of water changes and more water transitions. We also know that our aquifers are increasing because a lot of runoff is going into them from all of the watering that we do around us. Um, that's true here in the UAE. It's probably not true in other Gulf states. Um, the reason it's true here is that our aquifers are, are primarily saline anyway in the UAE. Um, and so, you know, we are having an impact on this on the world around us. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this kind of anthropopause, the great pause, and why maybe you can be critical 
in thinking about pandemics in the future and thinking about Earth's responses to pandemics, right? So this is an article which actually came out in 2018, before COVID-19 happened, and it's about bats and coronavirus and deforestation and how we are seeing more novel viruses jump from these kind of, let's say, exotic species from bats, from reptiles to humans because of deforestation, right? Probably when this paper came out, it probably didn't get a lot of attention, right? It wasn't a significant paper. Um, and in case you don't know how coronavirus got to us as humans, it's thought that it started in some kind of reptile. And it got from that reptile, like a pangolin, to a human, and from that human to the rest of the world, right? Some poor lady in China has been accused of being the person who, you know, first got COVID-19 and then passed it on to everybody. Um, but this kind of idea of this global spread of pandemics and epidemics, it's not something new. COVID-19 is not something new. Um, as you guys may or may not know, we had something called MERS, which was transmitted from camels to humans um, here in the Gulf region. It, most of the cases were in Saudi Arabia and the UAE as well as Oman. Um, they managed to get a vaccine for that very quickly and get it under control. It was very contained because it was in isolated populations. Um, we've seen similar with Zika virus, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, and Zika virus has long lasting impacts and we still don't have a vaccine for Zika virus. Um, basically the primary thing is don't get bit by mosquitoes if you're in South America or North America. Um, and so it's, you know, it's quite common that we see this chain, this transition of organisms from organisms transmitting viruses um, and illnesses to humans, right? Um, so, you know, the images like this, which show that basically, you know, we travel more today, so transmission is much easier. Um, and the expansion of wildlife and human interactions is much more significant. Um, and we are encroaching much more onto the habitats of organisms than we have ever have been before, right? So. The image that you can see of the earth shows the global hotspots for emerging infectious diseases that originate in wildlife. And you can see, and it's not surprising, that those hotspots are where the largest populations in the world are, right? Mexico, China, India, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, right? Uh, Philippines have very large populations, they have jungles, and the humans are encroaching more and more onto those natural environments. Um, so this kind of encroachment of humans onto environments is really what's driving this kind of change in the balance of our planet is what's driving this increase in pandemics around the world. And certainly there is an idea that this is also being impacted by changes in um, CO2 in the atmosphere resulting in global warming. The environment is much warmer illnesses tend to transmit better in warm and humid kind of tropical environments um, they like that environment they thrive in it right so so what we see is that also climatically we're seeing an increase in the available environments that these um, organisms can thrive in right where previously it might have been too cold in iceland for them to exist now it's just that much warmer that it's a tolerable level for these viruses, right? And that's because of climatic change, ongoing climatic and global change that we see, right? And so here's just a figure which shows you those tipping points, which shows you that if any of these things change, which we know they are changing, we can really start to drive massive increases in um, changes in temperature on our planet, right? So again, processes which are already happening, the increase in carbon dioxide, the increase in other greenhouse gases like NOx, um, SOx are already affecting our environment to a level where these organisms really can thrive. And we've wiped out quite a lot of our wildlife in terms of having this, you know, sick mass extinction, that normally these viruses would probably just live in monkeys and then die out, or they would live in the pangolin population and then die out, right? But because we're encroaching on those populations, we're now also pulling those viruses out with it, right? We're, we're, we're 
being more in contact with those viruses than we previously would have been, right? I doubt many people in the Gulf region even know what a pangolin is or have even thought about what a pangolin is, right? So to think that a disease came from a pangolin is, is kind of absurd and that that is something which is affecting us economically. Um, that's something difficult, I think, for us to really wrap our heads around. And, um, you know, a lot of that is related to this change in land use and this changes in these ecosystems and the biodiversity of our planet and the habitable space in our planet. All right. So let's get to this anthropopause. And I think you probably all feel like your lives have been on pause um, and that you've been kind of put into a freeze, right? And so what people started to feel was that while they were in this um period of lockdown they couldn't leave their house um that they were in this kind of great pause right this human pause this human pause in activity right um and so here's you know the diagram of the globe here that you can see is humans per kilometer square and then the image at the bottom is the percent change in humans visiting parks um, and if you look for our region it's really quite red right <laughs> Um, in Russia, I guess nobody goes to parks, and it's likely they just don't have data from that. And you can go to Google, and Google has this great thing. And probably most of you, you know, you go on Google to look for a location, to find a restaurant, and you know, so Google collects that data. Um, and here's a perspective from Kuwait of how that anthropopause affected you guys. And and you can look this up for any country. Um, in fact, the report for Kuwait has it by um, different districts. Um, so you can even look on the district level how Kuwait was impacted and I think it's really obvious that what you see is that there's a massive increase in the residential right so everybody stayed at home nobody was going to do retail or recreations probably nobody was going to the gym nobody was going to the mall or the movies nobody's going to the parks it only says it's a 50 percent decrease but still that's a massive decrease right and certainly nobody was going to work so transit is extremely low and the workplaces are really low relative to the baseline. Um, I think the workplace for other countries is a bit higher in terms of a negative number. Um, I'm, I think that mobility trends data for Kuwait is just a reflection of people's phones not being turned on at work or their location tracking not being turned on at work or something like that, right? But this is just to give you a perspective for you of how much your life changed as a country, right? And it is, it's really, really significant, right? So if you think that every day, or every day I get in my car and I drive to work, or I drive to the gym, and for four months, I didn't do that. I haven't been on vacation this year, right? Normally many of us would travel to Europe, or the US, or Australia, or Asia, none of us have been able to do that. Our carbon footprint, is therefore contracting as a human population. And the question that scientists are really starting to ask is whether in this Anthropocene period that we're really gonna see in the geological record and in the environmental record, this short pause of time, because it's been so significant, okay? And people have already started to kind of work on this and think about it, right? So here's just some, graphics basically that are kind of about this um this pause and what restrictions were put in place um some countries were more restrictive than others um as you know like for example here in abu dhabi you can't leave abu dhabi unless you you can't come back to abu dhabi unless you've had a covid test within two days that's our current policy that's in place um and basically you have to stay at home um you can only go to work if you've had a covid test and your test is only valid for two weeks um but then countries like the us you know you can do whatever you want you don't have to wear a mask you can go to a restaurant whatever right um and so this is just showing you how our emissions of carbon dioxide changed depending on our level of restriction okay so if you have no restrictions which is zero, right? That's not even on this. You're just looking at normal levels of CO2, right? If you're on level three, which is extremely high restrictions, the amount of CO2 that you would have produced would be extremely lower than it normally would be, okay? 
And I put the article in there in case any of you would like to read it because there's a lot of really interesting graphics, including this one, which shows you changes in um, activities on our planet, right? And these activities, we can map them to CO2. We can map them to um, noxious gas emissions. We can map them to changes in biogeochemical cycles, right? Changes in CO2 have an impact on uh, short-term biogeochemical cycle processes, um, specifically for sulfur um, and nitrogen and other gases like that. Um, so you can see there's a really a huge change globally in processes which have a significant impact on global greenhouse processes, okay? So here's a figure that shows you those CO2 emissions and shockingly, you see this massive drop in CO2. Right, it's a huge drop, okay? Um, it's unprecedented, right? We're going back to levels of CO2 in the early part of 2020 that we haven't seen for more than a decade, right? Just by us all staying at home, okay? All right, so here's that anthropopause again. Here's changes in CO2. Um, here's those changes in industry. And you know, these two are kind of linked. You've got your power industry and how that's changed. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of shutdown of oil and gas processes, right? A lot of wells shut down because of the price of oil presently under COVID-19. And so oil production has been low. Um, there's really a significant impact economically, climatically, environmentally from this pause. And I saw a picture today, which was actually on a Nature article. And it was a picture from Kuwait City of geese in the street. And I think a lot of people noticed that during this kind of pause interval that we saw more wildlife coming in to our environment, right? My husband said, I'm hearing more birds and we live under the flight path for Abu Dhabi Airport. Well, the reason we're hearing more birds is because we're not hearing the aeroplanes, but also there are more birds because the air is much cleaner. We're not seeing as many particulates in the atmosphere and particulates that are coming from cars, right? We, the air was much clearer um, here in Abu Dhabi, okay? And, this is an image from NASA, and this is an image of China, right? And I think this is very telling because this is showing NOx, it's showing that particulate matter in the air. And I'm pretty sure if you look for any country over the last, you know, kind of six month window, you will see something similar. You'll see that you have a pause period where there are no emissions, no particulates going into the atmosphere. And this kind of data, this kind of generation of these remotely sensed images, this is largely the work of our scientists, right? So, so this is something that if you're really interested in is, is, is an area that you could consider getting into with your knowledge um, as an earth science student, right? So you can see that in February, really, there was no emissions. And then as we start to come out of the kind of lockdown in China, what you start to see is those emissions increase. Now, you might be thinking that's great, and I'll go to the next image. You might think, wow, that's great, okay? So all these emissions have gone down and all this carbon dioxide has gone down, and so now we're at this period in Earth history where we're seeing these massive decreases in um, global emission levels, right? And that's gonna be great. And the problem that a lot of scientists are starting to think about and model is how, these economies such as China, where they have a huge industrial industry, and the, these outputs of NOx are list to their, linked to their industrial processes, and they have targets that they must meet. So now for six months, they've been unable to meet these targets because of workplace restrictions, uh, because of lockdown restrictions. And so what is likely to happen is that although we've had this short dip in CO2, as people start to go back to work, we're going to see a massive increase, a much, much bigger increase than we would expect in global greenhouse emissions, right? And this is something where we really have to start thinking about what is going to be the short-term impact of this, okay? What is going to be the short-term impact or long-term impact of a decrease in human activity, right? Are most people going to stay at home? Is it going to be 50% workforce in the office, 30% workforce in the office? How is that going to impact growth in cities? It's probably going to reduce growth in cities. Does that mean that we're going to see a contraction in human occupation of um, land that's normally occupied by wildlife? I don't know, but these are all things that we have to think about model. And the only other point in time 
where we have something similar to compare this to is the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic, right? So we have a lot of data from that. However, that data is not really being compared to COVID-19. There's very little information on it. Um, and so I think it's a good challenge for earth science students to really think about in the current circumstances, how can we take our knowledge of deep time and apply it to this situation to understand the impact of the present and the impact which is going to happen it coming out of this and going into the future how can we mitigate and manage our response so that it's not extreme okay how can we model that what kind of data can we collect so that we can record this interval right now okay um so here's just a few more figures they're from all from the same paper um that show you this kind of pre-covid 19 data and the covid lockdown data um you know you're all welcome to look at it um, I can send you the website link if you want to NASA website. Um, and uh, again, here you can see there's this kind of rebound. And as I said, in the rebound in Wuhan in China, um, in general, what they're seeing is a much higher release of carbon dioxide than they normally would have. Okay, so they basically saved up all their emissions. It's like a kid with candy, right? If your mom takes your candy away, you're going to eat 10 times more candy later on when she gives it back to you than if she just let you eat the candy for, you know, weeks on end, okay? Um, so here's just, I'm going to end in, in my next slide, but here's just another image from India about how this anomaly, this anomaly in our emissions has impacted India, right? Um, so here's aerosol optic data and AOD anomaly data. And you can really see that this anomaly in 2020, this anthropopause, really has impacted um, atmospheric particulate relief. Um, and it's just because of people not traveling by car and industries and coal burning reducing and oil burning reducing. Um, and when I look at figures like this, it really makes me start to think how the biogeochemical cycle has been impacted by us as humans and how we will see this event in our fossil record right um how will it appear um and i'm gonna end with that and you i will leave that slide there and you're all more than welcome to ask me any questions you like or email me questions if you're shy <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor. This was really interesting. Um, please, anyone, if you have any questions, you can write them down so that uh, the professor can answer them. It also, if you think I'm crazy, you're more than welcome to tell me. <laughs> if you don't believe in climate change, that's great too. Um, yeah, it, it's um, the first time I give this lecture, I've been thinking about it. So I'm really happy to hear from any of you about you know, what did I miss? What would you like to see? Um, you know, any thoughts that you have or ideas? Um, anything, anything really. Even if you just want to tell me hi, please go ahead. Um, I have a question here. Someone yeah, asked, ahead, what's Mario. the impact? Uh, what's the impact uh, in the long term? I don't know. And, and I think that's, if you look at the papers, and if anybody wants uh, me to share the some of the papers with them, I can share one or two with you. But in fact, I'm just going to we'll go to this next slide. But I think it's a bit blurry. But basically, all COVID-19 papers are free to everybody. You don't need a library access to access them. What we don't know, what we just saw was this huge dip in CO2, NOx, and SOx in the environment. And this includes particulate, right? So if we think about this as a slice of ice, right? Whatever ice was deposited in Greenland or or Iceland or the Arctic or the Antarctic, for this interval, what we're going to see is the really low emissions, right? Now, will this reduction of emissions for just a month have any impact, even a fraction of a degree impact? on climate change for this year, right? Will we perhaps not see the predicted one to two degrees Celsius increase in temperature? Will we see maybe half a centimeter, in, half a degree increase? I'm, I'm not sure, right? 
because we don't have good models of them because we haven't really studied events similar to this, although there are actually many, many, many of them. I found a great infographic earlier which showed you all of these different pandemics through uh, human history. Um, and, and what I appeal to you guys is if you're thinking about doing graduate studies, this kind of, it's called medical geology, I think, or something like that, it has its own name. But this idea of, of looking at these events in time and actually looking at the records of them and then the earth response or human response to them um, and what happened. So if we look at the 1918 flu pandemic, for example, what we, we do see in the data is that coal um, decreased, coal burning decreased, right? So emissions of sulfur, emissions of carbon dioxide would have decreased. What was the impact of that? Was it much colder the following year, right? Uh, was the particulate reduction, did that have an impact on lung health? Right, we don't know. We don't that link between geology and kind of um, earth science processes, earth systems processes, and human processes is so thin, right? Um, and you guys, you're young, right? So, so you can really start to think about this, and 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 you know, think about how you in your future maybe can start to bring together these two elements of of human and biogeochemical interactions, because it's something where we really don't have a lot of data. Um, and as what we'll see for the rest of the year, I think what we'll see is that CO2, SOx, NOx, particulates, POCs, are all gonna increase massively until December. So China gets its productivity targets back on track. India gets its productivity targets back on track. For the rest of Earth, as we come out of COVID, and, um, you know, like here in the UAE, it's been really slow in Abu Dhabi for us to come out. Um, so I suspect that we may see a whole year worth of reduction in CO2. And maybe that's a good thing for us. Um, yes, uh, go ahead. The, yeah, I'll just uh, give him access to the microphone. I'm in the dark in my office here, so I have to put a light on. Dr. Mohammed, I'll you access to the mic. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aisha, for this excellent presentation. I loved it, uh, whether the material or the way you presented it. So thanks a lot. Uh, I do have a question, which is you might uh, yeah, I heard this question before. It's a very simple question. It, nobody really like answered or satisfied my um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the answer that I'm looking for. Um, yeah. You showed, you showed really nice um, comparison between like uh, 1990 and 2016 of like how much ice uh, been melted yeah. or the drawdown of, 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 of yeah, water levels and different reservoirs worldwide. Well, this is now, it's, it's a fact. We cannot like really reject this because this is fact. This is real data, hard data. Now, yeah. how much this is due to the human activity on like on, on, on the type of like global warming yeah. or it's so climate think... change? Have you really seen any like uh, yeah, good so studies I think for, that yeah, I think for Lake Mead specifically, they have a lot of data for that lake. So they have data on how much water is released from the lake every year um, and where that water is going because it's a reservoir. Um, right. For China, the data for China is difficult, right? Because China still is all state information. Um, so for China, who knows, right? Um, up until a few years ago, they didn't have scrubbers on many of their coal burning plants. And I don't know if they still do. So are changes that we see in China related to changes in their industrial processes? And rather than human changes? I don't know, right? But I think for mm -hmm. most Western countries and for North America, certainly, um, like for the Mississippi Delta, for example, where you have huge amounts of... Um, uh, nitrates going into the Mississippi and out to the Gulf of Mexico and those nitrates they can track them with isotope markers right so they know right. that the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico are being driven by this runoff of nitrates by intensified agriculture along the Mississippi River right so so mm -hmm. in those cases for North America um, for some places in South America um, as well as Europe um, in some cases here, even in the Gulf, we have really, really good satellite data. Um, and we also have good 
what we don't have is we don't have a good data network of weather stations um, and sea monitoring stations, which are linked between the Gulf nations. So, I mean, we're relative, if you compare the Gulf nations to the US, right, we're a relatively small area. Um, and yet our data is not effectively linked in a way where we can really understand the climate impact here in the Gulf region, right? Um, and it could be really minimal. So, so what we can see here in the Gulf is we can see the impact on habitats of humans. We can't really see the impact of climate because we don't have data that go back that far because we don't have good coral records. I think there's one study from Kuwait, um, there's a study from Oman, uh, but our data is limited. We're in like a data black hole for climate data. Um, and the well, only way that we'll get- to globally, globally rather than like locally? Globally, are there any, like, on this? Any I, I mean, yeah, them? there are publications on CO2 emissions. Um, if you go on the NASA website and on the Ice Core website, uh, if you send me an email, you can access all the well, data. No, no. Well, see, see, the thing is, is uh, I agree that CO2, the data is like uh, recording like a, a significant increase due to the uh, like, uh, industrial revolution. Yet, how yeah. th is that increase in, in, in the numbers? really is impacting the climate as we are advocating for uh, as an env uh, environmentalist or do or we no, really see something... that link yeah i think i mean if you i mean obviously if you look at atmospheric data i think so i think what is tricky here is co2 because methane probably for us as humans is actually a much worse greenhouse gas and humidity. I don't know how humid it is in Kuwait, but here in Abu Dhabi is extremely humid. It's like 100% humidity, okay? Uh, so the issue that I have is that one, okay, so we know that the ice sheets are melting. This could be natural or it could be man-driven. It's irrelevant, okay? In the context right. of what I'm gonna say. It's, the ice sheets are shrink shrinking, so our albedo is shrinking, so available water on the planet is increasing. Therefore, the mm -hmm. amount of water vapor going into the atmosphere is increasing, right? right. Water mm -hmm. vapor is an extremely effective heat trap. If you go outside in Abu Dhabi in the US and it's like 80% humidity, even if it's 23 degrees, you're going to feel like you want to die, <laughs> right? Because right. you, you, can't, you can't release heat. Um, so you know, we know that this, that the, 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 all of these other gases that are much more potent than CO2 have a much higher emission level and that they can effectively trap heat. We know from experimental geochemistry, we know from atmospheric studies that they effectively trap heat. So we know that, we can see that in the data, we can see it in heat maps for the planet. Now, can you link that to temperature well, if you're seeing an increase in temperature and you're seeing an increase in things that trap heat and prevent it from leaving the planet, then the only assumption you can make is that those two things are linked. Because if they're not linked, then there's something wrong with the thermodynamics of the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. To some extent, yes. I don't, I don't know. Maybe your question is more complicated than I think. But I mean, it comes down to thermodynamics. It's not a well, problem, see, it's a see um, like we've uh, we've interviewed one of um, the, the like oil industry expert, and uh, he showed some data. Like he, he's stating that the claim uh, people are saying that CO two is the the only reason behind because uh, he's advocate for oil industry, right? And there are yeah, other but CO two CO two is not the only driver, right? Sulfur is an effective uh, greenhouse gas. Um, nitrogen is a, is a secondary greenhouse gas, so, so nitrogen release triggers other events which trigger greenhouse gas release. And, and we know that NOx has been increasing. Uh, in Europe it's decreased, but in China it's increased because of coal burning. Um, we know that methane, even in deep time, methane is an extremely effective greenhouse gas. Um, I mean, if you burn methane, <laughs> methane is an effective greenhouse gas. I don't, I think the science even not just from a geological or a kind of forget my personal opinion about whether I think climate change is real or not. I think from a thermodynamic perspective of how the gases operate in a physical state at steady state, we know these gases trap heat. 
So, I don't. I mean, oh. you know, go go turn your shower on to the hottest temperature. Close your bathroom door, and stay in your bathroom and check the temperature, and then you can prove it to yourself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I yeah. guess I guess now it's the thing is. Does it really like the heat? Does it really transfer the way we are yeah, saying? And uh, yeah. okay, if we increase the heat in somewhere, how fast that's going to increase the entire Earth globally? system? You know? Globally, yeah. yeah. But I mean, then you have to think about some, uh, you have to think about the summer hairline circulation, right? So, so in in on average, the climatic change is the temperature changes are happening very slowly, okay? Um, so as a kind of, if you look at the average global temperatures, and there are lots of images of average global temperatures, so you can look at them year by year, you can look at them month by month, you can do it for Kuwait, I'm sure there's tons of data for Kuwait. Um, if you look at that data, it doesn't look significant, right? It, it, if you go year by year, if you look, say, say you look at July from 2010 and July in Kuwait from this year, it's probably not going to be too different on that kind of time scale. Because that's uh -huh. not a very long time scale. However, if you start to look at it on the month, multi-decadal time scale, we do see that there is a huge increase in temperature. If you look at data from the US, from weather stations in the US and the UK, that go back, you know, to the late parts of the um, 19th century when temperatures recorded, mm -hmm. you can see there's a huge change in temperature in different states. Um, and if you average that out, yeah, we see a significant change in temperature. Um, and you can see the impact of these processes. I mean, you can see the impact of, you know, um, Pinatubo erupting on the climate. I mean, that's, that's a real thing. Those particulates changed how light was reflected on the planet. So I don't really, I mean, to me, maybe it's hard for me to see how you couldn't believe in that. Um, because of the background I come from, because of what I work on. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, the evidence is so strong and the thermophysical properties are so strong, the thermodynamic properties are so strong. Planetary forcing. I mean, we know if you shut one thing down, the climate is going to change elsewhere. Um, that evidence is also strong. I don't think you can argue that the temperature change is not real. Okay. I mean, cool. that's... that's, that's that's my scientific opinion. It's also my personal opinion. Um, and I think it, if somebody can prove to me in terms of thermodynamics and the physical properties of these gases um, and how they interact in the atmosphere that they are not trapping heat, then I would be more than happy to speak to that person because I've never ever seen any of the science that says that. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. You're Appreciate welcome. It. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Um, I think that's it uh, for us today. Thank you so much yeah. for being with us and for your time. Yeah, you're um, welcome we hope, anytime. Yes, we hope to see you uh, soon, inshallah. Yeah, and as I said, if I think my email's at the bottom. If you have any questions, yes. feel free to ask me, um, including about graduate school. Maybe you want to come to a little graduate school. Um, and if you want a link to any of the papers in my talk or to any of the NASA images, please do email me and I'm happy to share those with you. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you thanks so much. Yeah, thanks to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.